Well, good afternoon and uh, welcome. Um, thank you very much for joining us here today for our first Health Matters webinar for 2022 from St Vincent's Institute. Um, my name is Professor Natalie Sims and I'm Deputy Director of St Vincent's Institute and I'm the head of our Bone Cell Biology and Disease Unit. As we begin this webinar, I'd like to first acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which each of us are gathering from today. And I'd particularly like to pay my respects to the elders past and present of the Wurundjeri country, which is the land on which St Vincent's Institute stands and acknowledge their continuing, to connect, their continuing connection to land, sea and sky. I'd also like to pay respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples who are participating in this webinar today. Today, you're going to hear from um, two quite remarkable people. You're going to hear from lipedema advocate Nola Young, who's the chair of Lipedema Australia. And then you'll hear from one of our scientists, SVI's own Dr. Tara Kinesis, who works on lipedema research. So both of them will make their presentations to you, talk about the work that they do, the importance of lipedema research as well. And after the presentations, there will be time for questions and answers where you can write your questions to both Tara and Nola. You'll see on your screens that there's a Q&A button on the bar at the bottom of the screen. So at any point during their talks, please go ahead and type your questions into that box. Um, we will get to the questions at the end of both presentations. Uh, so please use the Q&A feature at any time. Um, we'll be using that instead of either the chat function or the raise hand function. So I hope you've all found that little box for your questions and answers. So pop them in at any time either to Tara or Nola. So the first person I'm going to introduce who'll be speaking to you today is Nola Young. Nola was the first president of the Lipedema Australia Support Society Incorporated, known as LASS, in 2012, and she's now the chair of Lipedema Australia. Nola is passionate in her belief that Lipedema Australia can make positive changes in the lives of those who have lipedema through education and support. Um, while advancing the research and recognition of lipedema throughout Australia and the world. Nola has been recognised by patient groups throughout the world as a compassionate woman who's dedicated her own lipedema experience to make a real difference for other women who have lipedema. Nola has been interviewed for numerous state and interstate television news segment, segments that have featured lipedema, and she's also featured in magazine articles promoting lipedema awareness, both in Australia and internationally. So Nola, thank you for joining us today. Um, please remember, if you've got questions for Nola, to pop them in the question and answer box. Nola, I'll hand over to you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. And thanks for invited, inviting me to speak today at this really special St Vincent's Institute Lipedema in the Spotlight, which is really important because it's Lipedema Awareness Month during June. So it's such an opportune time for us to be involved in this webinar. Advocacy, um, at its core, it's about supporting individuals to have a voice. I didn't plan on being a lipedema advocate, or for that matter, an advocate for any health concern. It actually happened after a 33 year long journey of searching for answers for myself. I wanted to know why my legs looked so different, why they were so heavy. My diagnosis in the finish was really quick. I went in, the specialist took one look at my legs and said, mm, it's not lymphedema, it's lipedema. No diet will fix it, stay healthy, and there's no cure. My stomach sank because immediately I knew my younger sister had it too. We both used to moan that we had Nan's legs. It was a bittersweet diagnosis and it set me on another journey. It took another six years to finally find out anything else about lipedema. In those days, you could Google lipedema and hardly anything came up. And that was the thing about getting a diagnosis in those days. It was hit and miss to get a diagnosis and getting any information that might help you understand your diagnosis. 
was almost impossible. I wanted to help myself, but I just couldn't find out any information. And in my search, I eventually came across a small Australian Lipedema Facebook group with just a few members. It grew to be known as LAS and later Lipedema Australia. It was like finding my long lost family. I really can't describe the relief in finding others that understood what I was going through. I quickly became involved enough so much that I became the first chair of Lipedema, of LAS and then Lipedema Australia, a position I've held for more than 10 years. But that's when I learned that being chair, I had to show the way. I had a privileged position, you see, because I heard so many women's journeys. I was a listening ear to so many horrific journeys, so many sad stories. And I knew that I could do something with my voice. And I, that's the why, how I became an advocate. It was something I could do. I had to be brave, I had to be bold, and I had to be courageous. Being an advocate of a fairly common but seldom diagnosed disease brought great responsibility. Like myself, most patients had a torturous journey. Been told by many doctors that you were fat and obese, just stop putting things in your mouth and you'll be okay. How that was going to help when the top half of me was thin and the bottom half of me was huge, I don't know. I've learned being an advocate that I was pushed, was going to be pushed well out of my comfort zone. I had to show my legs. I was filmed by national television in my underwear more than once. My legs became very famous. It wasn't something I planned. I can remember once being even recognised in the airport. And it wasn't really for my face, it was for my legs. Uh, not that I was wearing my underwear, but they could tell from my jeans. I'm actually quite a humble person, a shy person, but I'm somebody that can't be a bystander. I can't just stand by the side when people are hurting. So as a lipedema advocate, I've needed to be brave, bold and courageous to create awareness and educate others. For young women I have on my mind, I do this to give them hope so that young, healthy, active teenagers, almost exclusively girls, don't develop into adults suffering unbearable pain, disfigurement, and that blights their career prospects, their family life, their social life, and ultimately stunts their growth and their independence. I did it for women who had lost hope. Like many of my colleagues, the Volunteer Board of Lipedema Australia sought to raise public awareness of lipedema treatment and management. This slide was part of our Lipedema Awareness Campaign during Lipedema Awareness Month in 2015 called Make a Wish for Lipedema. This slide went around the globe in seconds. We had newspapers as far as Ireland ring us. And still today, we're asked if this slide can be used. It was the first time that women with lipedema had shown their legs in public. It was the first time that it had been put on the internet. Afterwards, there was a German and a US photo shoot. We paved the way. Lipedema women had always tried to opt out of photographs. We had to get out. 
we'd always hid behind our maxi skirts and our long pants or we were in the back row of photographs. I had to show my legs often, you know, but once I showed my legs and they became famous, me and my legs were a got around a lot. There was a lot of reluctance by some people to get out and enjoy their life as lipedema patients. So my motto was, didn't matter. You needed to live the life as best you could. So I wanted people to exercise and to swim and enjoy a healthy life. So I had to show the way. So there's many slides in on inter internet of me in my underwear or in my swimwear, living a full life. Fortunately, I went to see Ramin Shayan about my lipedema. The fact that sheer relief of finding a specialist who would not only listen to me, but was interested in lipedema, an orphan disease, he called it. And in fact, Ramin said, come again, bring along another board member. I want to have a chat to you. Ramin had been appointed the director of the O'Brien's Institute, and he was really empathetic and keen to be involved in research in this field. We were really, really lucky. Soon after our 2016 National Conference, anonymous donor came forward and thus started the first steps. We always felt at Lipedema Australia that we were equitable partners with O'Brien's Institute and SVI. Visits to the Lipedema Lab cemented that bond. We felt really special that in Melbourne that we had a Lipedema Lab, one of the first in the world. In fact, I think it was the first in the world. Immediately, Ramin, Tara, Musarat, welcomed us into the research lab and we visited many times. For a patient-centered organization like Ipodem Australia, it's really special when you're involved in all stages of research, advocating for patients and families to be involved, providing fat samples and DNA samples, assisting with organizing DNA days, raising funds. It's been exhilarating. But it was important because they were using our lived experience and our expertise to make sure that the research was patient-centered. But our connections were really useful because we had connections with patients right around Australia. So we were partners in this. And in return, part of that partnership was the availability of the Lipedema Lab researchers to speak to us at conferences, at lunches, at special fundraising events. And this is Tara, a slide of Tara at a Lipedema Awareness Month lunch a couple of years ago. The release of St. Vincent's Institute's medical research on lipedema was emotional. We shed lots of tears of joy. To read that the research found that my experience and my lipedema sister's experience of lipedema was legitimate and lipedema fat is not the same as obesity is affirming but overwhelming. But they also found that lipedema fat cells differ from normal fat cells. And that's and at almost every way. And they don't function like normal fat cells. 
and they grow at an unrestricted rate. For us, this research offers so much hope. Once we used to dream of a cure for lipedema, it actually seemed frivolous. But now it's so possible, it's just a breath away. Not today, not tomorrow, but soon in the future. And as Chair of Lipedema Australia, I feel I've been really fortunate to be involved. It's not only going to help us in our, our steps to get Medicare, but it helps my family and others. It is going to help my sister's family. It's going to help our future generations so they don't suffer this crippling disease like we have. So they won't suffer the label of obesity or have the comorbidities and the other problems related to lipedema. I'm so hopeful that this next phase of research can commence soon so that women with lipedema and their families and future generations around the globe can live a better life. That's what we want, a better life. Now that's a thing that's worth fighting for. That's something that I'm so glad that I stood up for. I'm so glad that I wasn't a bystander, but I instead became an advocate for change. Thank you for letting me talk today. Thank you so much, Nola. Um, thank you for sharing your journey with us and for your bravery, um, which I'm sure everyone can see from your presentation is both continuing to raise awareness of lipedema and is encouraging many women to share their story and to live healthier and full lives. And, and thank you for your ongoing connection with our scientists here at SVI. I'll just remind people who are attending that um, you're welcome to ask questions of NOLA. I'll come back to them at the end of Tara's talk, but you can feel free to pop your questions in already within the questions and answer. And I can see that people are also starting to put in that their own thank yous to NOLA in the chat. So I encourage you to do that too. Our next speaker is um, Dr. Tara Kinesis, um, who's a scientist here at St. Vincent's Institute at SVI. Tara began her science career with a PhD at the Department of Biochemistry at La Trobe University in Melbourne. And after successfully completing her PhD, Tara was offered a postdoctoral position at the prestigious Department of Medicine at Stanford University in the US. Dr. Carnesis then returned home to Melbourne, came back to Australia, initially to the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research and the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre, where she spent the next 10 years in research leadership, heading programs with commercial application. In 2016, Dr. Carnesis was offered a laboratory head position here at SVI in the O'Brien Department. Tara co-heads her laboratory with Dr. Ramin Shayan, who you've just seen photos of as well in Nola's presentation. Ramin is a Melbourne plastic surgeon who surgically treats women with lipedema. And it was this collaboration with Ramin which initiated a keen research interest in Tara in studying lipedema. Dr. Carnesis has been involved in key international mentoring and business development programs, as well as her research, facilitated both through the US Consulate and through Georgetown University. Dr. Carnesis continues to deliver high impact, internationally peer reviewed science and translational research, which means it goes right from the laboratory bench through to treating, treating patients. And she has grassroots experience in navigating biotech setups and pipeline establishment phases within Victoria. And she's committed to use her science and her entrepreneurial experience to really make a difference to those who suffer from lipedema. So Tara, over to you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie, for that introduction. And I'm just sitting here listening to Nola and reminded of why I'm my purpose and why I'm so excited to be involved in this project because I see how much a difference it makes to the lives of people with lipedema. So um, I'm here to try and make a difference for them. 
but more importantly, we want to try and seek answers for them. Um, and so what I'm going to talk to you today is, is the last um, four or five years of our research, once we started collaborating with Lipidema Australia and got more and more involved in the project itself. And uh, I'm just going to give you an overview of what we've discovered and where we potentially want to take this in the future. So my title is Lipidema Matters, um, Uncovering Science to Drive Hope for a Cure. A little bit about lipidema. You saw Nola, um, she's the person, but now I would like to talk about the disease itself. Um, it's, it's a very debilitating disease. It's a chronic disease. Um, often um, onset is often occurs in puberty um, during IVF. Uh, pregnancy and menopause. So you can see there's probably a hormonal connection there, although that hasn't been fully validated yet. Lipidema is basically a disease where there's abnormal fat deposits primarily in the lower extremities. And the problem with that is it, it often leads to um, immobility issues, which in turn causes obesity long-term. And Nola touched on this subject. Um, it's not something that can be addressed by diet and exercise alone. So these women who have lipedema sometimes do quite um, extreme diets where they basically starve themselves in an attempt to shift weight, but that, that weight is not refractory to diet or exercise. From studies or limited studies that have been done, um, it's primarily, we, we, we think it might it may be a familial inheritance pattern, primarily in females. Although there is some uh, data around a, a small minority of, of um, males having lipedema. As I mentioned to you, it's basically a pathological accumulation of fat in the lower extremities, like mainly the legs. Interestingly, the feet are often spared of that. So it's basically from the ankle upwards. Um, lipidema is diagnosed by a certain waist to hip ratio. Um, as I mentioned to you, there's a lot of, there's, uh, it's often ankles are spared. There's cuffing at the knees, uh, as you can see here. Uh, the other very important thing that I have spoken to many lipidema patients, pain is something they all, um, talk about the extreme pain. So pain is something that they, uh, on, on a daily basis, they call them painful legs, hyperflexibility. So interestingly, uh, lipedema patients can be very flexible. Their joints are very flexible. Uh, and the other thing that they experience is really bruising, very easy, easily bruised. Uh, the, the side effects of lipedema are secondary uh, arthritis because they have to carry that extra weight that's put, that puts a lot of pressure on the bones, uh, difficulty walking and mobility issues. There are four stages to lipedema. At the first, initially you have this the stage one all the way through to stage four. And as I mentioned, this is a progressive disease. So over time, patients will experience these stages. Often, sometimes it's induced by hormonal changes. So like pregnancy, women uh, may not have been, may have been at stage one at, early on in their um, adolescence and uh, young adulthood, get become pregnant and then develop like accelerated lipid lipidema, which um, takes them to go and see a doctor. And, and then that's when they get diagnosed. Uh, it's it, the diagnosis itself, there isn't really one consensus around it. It's by pattern recognition by a, a medical um, expert or healthcare professional. There's no clear uh, consensus around what is lipidema and what isn't. And I think the fact of the lack of awareness has also caused that problem. Um, <clears throat> I'll just, these are a couple of videos just to demonstrate to you the patient experience. Um, Nola spoke about uh, her experience throughout her, uh, ex uh, her life having lipedema. Um, quality of life is definitely impaired in, in these patients. They often have life threatening complications due to secondary health issues such as obesity that's caused by. Um, uh, immobility it's not the it's not the cause of the disease it's caused by the immobility due to lipedema 
And as a, a secondary effect of that is lymphedema. And this is basically as a swelling, the swelling of, of tissue caused by a, um, a stress on the lymphatic system. So you can imagine extra weight puts extra stress on the lymphatic system that leads to lymphedema. And there's a whole new um, side of um, issues around that. Heart and cardiovascular disease and diabetes are often um, can be uh, can occur due to these uh, secondary issues. But I think the main thing is there's significant psychosocial distress. There's often depression and anxiety with these patients. Um, people have been fat shamed um, and stigmatized throughout their whole lives, uh, and I think that's that's a terrible thing to have to live with. And as I mentioned, um, patients can develop lymphedema as a secondary um, issue resulting from lipedema. So I'm just going to show you an example of what it's like to walk with lipedema. You can see this is just a patient, remains patient. Okay, stop and turn around and walk away. And this is another um, patient from Ramin um, who, who suffers the same gait issues. So that lack of ability to walk freely has, has leads to obesity and issues down the track. A little bit about the, how wide the, the demographics are. Uh, this is an old study basically that was um, done in the US. So according to that study, uh, approximately 10% of adult females uh, uh, have lipedema. And if we extrapolate that to uh, Australia, um, around uh, quite a significant, around 10% of Australian females, or that, that's around a million to 9 million Australian females would, 1 million Australian females would be uh, experiencing lipedema. And as a result of this, this does have an impact on the healthcare system because people with those secondary effects that I spoke about end up in hospital, in and out of hospital. Um, it, it adds up to significant cost to the healthcare system. Um, and we're talking of hundreds to billions of dollars of that. Current treatments, um, there aren't that many. Um, it is definitely a disease of unmet need. Uh, the treatments that are available, are non, there, are, there is either a non-surgical option, um, uh, or massage or, or um, compression garments, or a surgical option, which is very costly, invasive, uh, time-consuming. And of course, like every operation, there's always a risk associated with that, especially when you um, operate on, on patients with late stage lipedema. Uh, there isn't any, as I mentioned, uh, diagnosis or staging. There's no uh, precise diagnostic or biomarker that clinicians can use to, to confirm um, suspicions around uh, patients that they think may have lipedema. And uh, at the moment, there's no real monitoring of progression or treatment. So people that undergo, for example, surgery, there's no follow-up studies on those patients, like at one, five and 10 year follow-up to see what the um, development, what, what the, um, the effect of that surgery was on these patients. So you can see there's quite a gap in, in, in a lot of research around lipedema. I'm just gonna to present to you some, a good time story, um, which is a patient of Ramin's who probably, uh, who, who presented with stage one lipedema and opted for a surgical uh, uh, treatment. So the, the, the point to note here is this, this patient was very early stage where the bulk hadn't been, um, the, the, a lot of fat hasn't, hadn't been deposited on, the, on her legs yet. She opted for surgical treatment uh, this treatment was very surgery, but more importantly, it, cost, it took a long period of time and she had to have one egg, uh, one leg operated on um, each time for the surgery. However, she was able to go from, uh, from her lipedema to a more less heavy leg, which allowed her to take part in more 
physical activity, and that definitely improved her quality of life. And this is something she wrote to Ramin. She, she just was thanking him for her amazing ability to walk um, without having that pain or heavy leg feeling and, and just getting on with life. So these patients, um, while surgery is, is great for an initial treatment, the long-term effects, we still don't know. Um, Um, and it doesn't necessarily work for all patients. You can say this patient with lipedema may not be necessarily a good candidate for surgery. So uh, the, the, there's still a lot, a lot of work to do in order to understand, enhance our understanding of lipedema in order to develop treatments that will not involve any sort of long-term surgery and will have um, an impact on the patient for throughout, throughout their life. So what we need to do is sort of what we've realized is our conventional treatment has a failed to address the need for all patients. And I'm not talking about the select few that opt for that very expensive time consuming surgery. I'm talking about a treatment that would be um, that would help all patients. Surgical treatment makes tissue available for analysis. So the good thing is when um, people with lipedema undergo surgery, researchers like myself have access to that tissue and we can begin to interrogate that tissue and try and understand what, what makes it the way it is. The other good thing is, um, as like everything, technology becomes better and better. So the technology available to us as scientists has allowed us to do things we probably couldn't do 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And it means that we can get um, to uh, answers much quicker and, and very informative answers today. There is a consumer organization and fundraising. So people with lipedema like NOLA has an advocacy group. So ad awareness is something that's very important for research. Um, we want to have research that's for purpose. And I really love what I do. I love the fact that I can talk to patients and then go to the lab and have my team working on solutions to help these patients. So basically, there's a lot to do. There's a lot of questions that need to be answered and we have to start at the ground roots. We have patients, we have advocacy, we have the ability to access tissues and, and you know, for investigation. So we're in a position to do some really good research here. So our first approach, the way we tackled the problem initially was um, we, we wanted to understand if there was any genetic basis around lipedema because that, that would be a very simple way to understand the disease. And we had uh, initially, uh, we had initiated a, a, a genetic study and we had a couple of uh, twins. We had a, a tr uh, families that had affected and unaffected individuals. And we, um, went, we went through the process of uh, doing a lot of gene testing to try and see whether or not there's a gene that's involved that gets passed down from mother to daughter and if so, what is that gene? Um, and this is a manuscript. I mean, this is the result of that study. These are the families that we um, utilised in that study and these dark dots here represent the affected individual and these are the parents or um, unaffected members of their family. And to cut a long story short, um, all this demonstrated to us that there unfortunately isn't one gene per se, but there seems to be... Um, pathways, we could see from this analysis that there were specific um, issues with certain parts of, of the genetics of, of lipedema patients that were not regulated. So this, this, is, this study will be, is, is, will be um, submitted for publication soon. And I'm aware of another group in England that have done something very similar on a much wider scale that have come to the same conclusion. So we can validate our results between us and another group around the world to demonstrate, to show definitively that there isn't one gene involved. So what do we do next? The next approach we use is to take advantage of new and very exciting technology platforms that are available to us. We have tissue that we can access from the patients that undergo surgery, and we can start interrogating the tissue itself. And we can compare that tissue to women that have obesity 
and undergo surgery to remove that excess fat. So suddenly we're in a position where we can compare the lipedema women with um, patients that have non-lipedema or obesity. And we're able to ask a very simple question and a question that's been plaguing the uh, field for a very long time and has caused a lot of debate between scientists and clinicians alike. Is lipedema obesity? And to do that, we um, set out to uh, um, submit a human ethics application to St. Vincent's Hospital. We got out, we recruited our patients, we um, isolated the tissue, and we looked specifically at stem cells because we felt that that was the best cells to start with and compare any differences in the tissue because a stem cell can, um, is, is the basis for the, the fat in the tissue. So what a stem cell is, if you think about it, it's just a cell that doesn't really know where to go or what to become. It has to become stimulated by um, the, its environment um, to become something. So in the case of fat, we all have fat stem cells within our tissue. They are present at birth. And when they are stimulated with the right stimulus, in, in that case, um, you know, extra calories or metabolic changes, they become stimulated to grow into fat. So we thought that would be an ideal uh, cell to look at specifically in lipedema patients. So that's what we did. We um, took the stem cells, we compared, we took the tissue, we did a whole array of, of very um, integrated science experiments, and we were able to hone into a specific um, a gene that we thought would be relevant, uh, one gene that would be relevant in, in lipedema. And we were able to sort of understand its role in lipedema and what it does precisely. And more interestingly, we um, there are some uh, drugs available to that gene as well. And this is us, this is the team that was involved in that project. Myself, um, Ramin and, and Dr. Musrat Ishak, who's a postdoc in my laboratory, along with um, some others that have been involved over the duration of the five years. Um, in this study, we used a BMI matched and anatomically matched um, tissue. So we took tissue from between stages two and three, because they're the ones that usually uh, undergo surgery from, um, from, from Ramin's patients. And we were able to compare tissue from the thighs to um, other uh, tissue from thighs from women that have not been diagnosed with lipedema. And this is uh, just, I'm not going to go into the detail of the science. Suffice to say that you can immediately see that lipedema fat on tissue is very different to the lovely um, buttery texture of, of the non-lipedema obese tissue. You can see a very clear difference, differences here. And that also translates very nicely when we look at genes um, expression levels. So genes that are go um, up and down in lipedema and, and non-lipedema tissue, you can see that there are differences and that's what this um, uh, map represents here. Furthermore, when we started looking at the stem cells that are present within this tissue, we compared stem cells within lipedema and stem cells within um, the non-lipedema obese tissue, we could see that there are actually more, way more um, in, in the lipedema tissues. So if you've got more stem cells that are present in the tissue, when, you, when they're stimulated, you can imagine there's gonna be more of them to become fat, which could potentially account for the fact that you're going to, you have way more excessive tissue in lipedema patients. So we wanted to investigate this a little bit further. And basically this is our um, roadmap of what we've done. We just took tissue. We um, created a, a way to harvest these stem cells from this tissue. And we the, the cells were, went through an investigative process in our laboratory. And what we did first was we wanted to see can these stem cells, when they form fat, and this is basically fat in a dish, these green um, uh, cells here represent fat cells. And you can see all the fat globules within the cells themselves. So we took stem cells from lipedema patients and non-lipedema patients. We stimulated them to create fat in a dish. And then we measured, well, what kind of fat do you get? And basically what we saw was you get 
a very different uh, ability of the lipidema stem cells to create fat. The fat is different that the lipidema stem cells create. And not only is it different, there's a different chemical composition as well. So it's different morphologically, i.e. it looks different and the chemical composition is different. And the types of lipids that are created in lipidema stem cells and lipidema fat are sort of lipids that really um, promote expansion of tissue and proliferation. So you can kind of start seeing the dots being connected as we're starting to get a, a better picture. I suppose one, a few pieces of the puzzle are coming together and, and we're, we're starting to rationalize, okay, there's, there's a reason why these women are the way they are. More importantly, when we kind of look to see where, how the stem cells, where in the cell cycle, the stem cells um, are affected, we basically demonstrated that lipidema stem cells are in a state of constant proliferation. They, are, they really want to grow. They just want to grow. And we could demonstrate that this as well by um, this experiment here um, that basically demonstrates that uh, lipidema stem cells are definitely um, in a proliferative state. And this was also, um, this, was, this ex next experiment also supports that uh, hypothesis. And when we look to see well, what are the genes that are regulating this proliferation and expansion state, we came down to a, a, a number that, that are represented here. And we focused on one in particular called BUB1. And the reason why we did that is because there's a lot of BUB1 present in lipidema tissue compared to non-lipidema tissue. Um, a, a lot of BUB1 in other diseases mean like cancer, for example, means you have cells growing uncontrollably. So that sort of made sense to us. And more importantly, there are drugs available against BUB1 um, that sort of slow down that growth process. So for these reasons, we sort of, for the, the purpose of the study, we, we focused in on that particular gene. And basically what we showed that indeed there is a lot more BUB1 in lipidema tissue and in the stem cells. And BUB1 itself is, um, it's really activated, meaning that uh, it is telling the cell, you must grow, you must grow, you must grow. So there's a lot more activity um, around in, in lipidema stem cells compared to non-obese and non-lipidema obese stem cells. The other thing we did was when we, we asked the question, if you remove BUB1 from the cell, what happens to the lipidema stem cell? And we did that experiment where we genetically engineered the cells to not have it present. And what we found in this particular case is it definitely slowed down that process. It sort of normalized it to a more normal level of cell growth. So that again, validated to us that this was something that is potentially real in the disease. And the last experiment we did was basically we took the lipidema stem cells and treated them with BUB1 drugs. Um, so BUB1 drugs stop BUB1 from working. And what we were able to demonstrate in that experiment was we sort of slowed down that whole growth process or the growth of these stem cells of the lipidema stem cells, basically back to sort of normal, normalized levels. So in summary, what we have demonstrated through our five years of work and working together with Lipidema Australia and working together with the patients is we're starting to unravel. And I'm talking, this is just a tip of the ice where there's a lot more work we're doing and that needs to be done. Uh, what we've shown is bub one um, from our work appears to, pay, to play a key role in lipedema and offers a therapeutic avenue potential therapy. Uh, we've validated BUB1 in preclinical studies. Um, and what we're looking to do further is um, develop animal models because unfortunately in this particular disease, because it's been, there's, there hasn't been a lot of awareness and study around it, good animal models for us to test haven't been available. So we must start developing those and if we wish to start looking for cures. So that's something we, we're, we're developing in the lab at the moment. We obviously need money, can't do research without money. So at the moment, we're trying to apply for all sorts of grant. And um, it, was a, it was a really lovely thing. Um, when this paper came out, we, we got a, lots of donations and interest. So my, my 
utmost gratitude goes out to all the um, people that are supporting the research and, and want to make a difference to the, the lives of, of, of these women with lipedema. In, uh, over time, we would like to partner with some industry and we've had interest in that, which is really good. By industry, I mean pharmaceutical companies that could actually accelerate and help this um, and potentially design novel drugs that we have access to ourselves. And ultimately, what we would like to do is potentially look at this work and expand to, uh, to into obesity and other metabolic diseases, because my fascination in this is, is quite, I'm, yeah, it, it's every day is an interesting day at work, put it that way. I'd like to thank the McMullen Family Trust and um, Lipedema Australia and other, sort, and other Stafford and Wicking and O'Brien Foundation for their amazing support over the years because without this support, we wouldn't have any pieces of that puzzle starting to emerge. And I love working with the patients. Um, it's just been an exhilarating journey for me as a scientist working with these women and, and then sort of me, it just reinforces my purpose. And if anyone has any questions, um, my door is always open, please reach out. And I thank you for your attention today. Great. Thank you so much, Tara. And as Tara mentioned, uh, we'd, we'd love to have any of your questions. Really, now the time is over to you as our audience for questions either of Tara or of Nola. I can see we've already got one there. And I might get Tara and Nola to both have their cameras on, so it's more like a, a panel discussion. So we've got you both there. Um, so, yes, um, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see there's the Q&A box. Please click on that and put your questions in there. So we've already got a question in here from Sandra Deary, and, and this is a question for Tara, which is whether BUB1 drugs are being used in human trials yet. No, they're not being used in human trials yet. They're at the preclinical stage. There's a lot of work um, or there's work being done uh, of these drugs in cancer, different sort of cancer models. But um, from my, from what I know, I, no one's actually looked at BUB1 beyond cancer. So this is a sort of the first time that we're looking at it in a different disease setting. Great, thank you. Um, I might also ask some questions to, to get things going. Um, I, Nola mentioned that she and her sister both have lipedema and, and her grandmother also did. And Tara, you talked about how there's not just one gene for lipedema. It seems like there's quite a few that are involved in this condition. Do, do you think that in the future, it might be possible to have a, a genetic test where people have a, a paddle yeah. of genes that are assessed. Yeah. That's what I, that's what we sort of talk about a lot. Exactly. Natalie, I think if you kind of know what pathways and the light, then you can start amassing a panel, like you say, and that might be a great diagnostic and, uh, or biomarker tool that we could use in the future. Yes, absolutely. Terrific. And, and I was also struck by some of the images that Nola showed of, of how, how variable lipedema can be with, with different individuals. Do you think that is, is because they have different genetic causes for some of those individuals, or do you think that's more to do with, with, with how their genetics relate to what, whatever else is going on in their life with lifestyle factors and things like that? My, my feeling is that it's a heterogeneous disease. So it's not like there's one gene that affects it. Epigenetics is probably going to be involved in a lot of this. Um, and because of all of this, it makes it hard to pinpoint exactly how you would need to manage it. Um, definitely lifestyle is going to make a difference. So some people are very active. I showed you the image of that, uh, one of Ramin's patients who is active, um, and that may affect the progression of the disease as opposed to someone with a more sedentary lifestyle like me who sits a lot in chairs you know if you know if someone if I had lived the demo I would probably be more accelerated than others because I'm often sitting down yep right we've got we've got some more questions that are starting to come in in the Q&A now and if, if I can get my computer to behave itself I can ask <laughs> some of those so there's another question about Bub Bub one. So Yanka Noit has asked, could Bub one, besides creating proliferating lipo fat, could it also cause hyperinsulinemia or, or changes in blood sugars or diabetes? We haven't done that analysis yet. Um, what we would like to do is test it in an animal model, um, but we're in the process of developing that. So that's something we could definitely look to see what other effects that would have 
in other parts of physiology or disease, of course. Yeah, and I'll jump into a question that's appeared in the in the chat, which is really a question for both of you. So I might ask Nola to answer it first, and then and then over to you, Tara, which is about what's being done to educate GPs and other people about lipidemia versus obesity. So I think this is really about what's being done both from Lipidemia Australia and educating patients. But so I'll get Nola's perspective first, and then and then Tara's perspective on this. Lipidemia Australia have. Um taken that on board and we feel that very much it's a grassroots thing that we think that every patient has a responsibility to do some education um, we have um, obviously we have really good quality um, pamphlets that people can get from us to take to their GP um, some people do have problems in going to visit their GP um, only yesterday I heard someone who was told by their GP that lipidema didn't exist and we still hear that quite often and our response is to find another GP. Um, if you can't convince that one, go and see somebody else because there are plenty around now that who will listen to you. Um, it's a little bit different than it was a few years ago and lots of patients go in with information and say look I think I might have this and um, so I think that that's where you've got to start. Lipidem Australia has um, got lots of information, um, doesn't support as well as education and this weekend we have our conference on that people could go in person or um, online and that's been really well received and that's part of the way we educate and we've got heaps of professionals going to that um, and that's part of the way we do it. That's great and I've just put the um, link for the website for Lipedema Australia into the chat Thank so you. people attending the, the um, seminar can look that up as well. Tara did you have any comments on the education of the general public and of, of GPs as well? I think um, sort of differentiating it, differentiating it from obesity is the first step. And for a long time, as I said, it was all lumped into one um, disease. Mm. Um, it's it's difficult because even to this day, there are several people that still call, think of it as obesity. So research is going to be critical in in supporting those claims because if we can demonstrate with science rigor that it is different, then there's no question. And then that's where the education and um, will all begin. Diagnosis, like, like what we said, Natalie, having a diagnostic, some sort of kit that would mm -hmm. distinguish it would be ideal. And that's what we're working towards. Great. We've got we a few. Really, sorry, sorry. We really believe that the research that um, was released just before Christmas um, was critical in patients being able to take that and say, here, this is the proof that lipedema is different to obesity. Yes. We've got a, another question from, from Heidi Roberts this time, uh, and this is a double barrel question. So she's asking first, does the lipedema fat grow back after surgery? And she's also asked, do you think this might be due to BUB1 still being present in the body? And looks like you're already saying it does grow back, so I won't answer the last part. No, of I, it's a great question. A great yeah. question. It's something we talk about as well. So if you talk to Ramin, as I said, follow-ups haven't been done. But when like patients that have undergone surgery for and like two or three years later and they see therapists, when I talk to the therapist, they will tell me it, it's starting to grow back. And that I would predict that because the surgery, while it's great uh, initially, it does remove the bulk. The core of the problem is still there. The stem cells or the, the disease tissue, there's still remnants of it. So it, it would grow back. That would make sense. But again, we need to do follow-up studies with, this, with the clinicians. Right. Then we have a, another question here from Sushari Hedirachichi. When, when, hmm. It's, it's really asking, I think, um, it might be asking about when the bub gene is expressed. There might be a missing word there. But the connection is whether um, lipidemia is connected with, with hormones of, of women. So I guess the question is why, why is it more common in women and what's the connection with, with female hormones? Uh, 
I would, yes, I would say definitely um, hormonal imbalance or hormonal triggers are definitely um, prompt the condition. Um, probably estrogen or progesterone, which is why there's more women affected. Um, in the few men that there are, uh, if you look at their hormonalers, I suspect um, there would be that sort of imbalance as well. Uh, hormones would definitely be the trigger. Um, what sustains it is another question we need to ask as well. Yeah. So we've, we've dealt with all the questions that are there in the Q&A and, and we're coming close to the hour. So um, what I'll do now is to extend our thanks both to Tara Karnesis and to Nola Young for your presentations today. Thank you so much. I have really enjoyed listening to both of you. And I know that everybody attending also will have. I'd also like to thank all the people who've attended. Thank you so much for coming along. Uh, for those who want to watch the webinar again or who have friends or family that might be interested in watching it, we'll send around the recording in the coming days. So you'll have a link to that and you can then share it. We'll also send out a survey for your feedback so we can continue to bring you engaging virtual events where you can learn about matters important to our health. And we would love it if you would take a few minutes to complete that. Also, if you'd like to join our mailing list at SVI, if you're not already on it, to receive event and research news, or if you're interested in hearing more about the work that SVI does, um, please email Simone Flanagan at foundation at svi.edu.au. And I've put that into the chat so you can copy and paste that if that's easier for you. And please, as we, as we head closer to the end of the financial year, if you'd like to make a donation as you head towards tax time or at any time, really, either to Tara's work or to the work done by any of our researchers here at SVI, please head to our website and I'll put the link for that in the chat as well. Um, please head over there um, or get in touch directly with Simone Flanagan at our foundation and I've popped her email in the chat as well. So thank you very much for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. <laughs>